Hi, it's Dennis Daly. I've posted over 100 excerpts from some of my more than 250 American montage shows that I did in the 1980s and 90s while at UPI Radio. Recently, I embarked on a fresh series of shows. We're in the lobby of the Strader Hotel in downtown Durango, Colorado, and my special guest is... Dwayne Smith. Doctor. Well, that's true. What's, what's the doctor from? Are uh, you a veterinarian? No, no, I got it's PhD, <laughs> doctor in history. That's better than I did, let me tell you that. Dwayne, let's talk in this hour about the West, about Durango, about the railroad. This is one part of the world I've never been to. I've been to Denver quite a lot, uh, used to spend a week every fall in Breckenridge, got over to Aspen, which is almost over in this part of the Rockies, but not quite. I will say today, driving from Glenwood Springs down here, my only real disappointment is that the cold weather and the uh, snow that hit us kind of destroyed the Aspens. And one of my best memories of Colorado was in Breckenridge, driving across Boreas Pass once mm-hmm. to Como, Colorado, I think, through a tunnel of Aspen as the sun came through it. So I went back and I told the guys in our party, I said, i got to take you there tomorrow, i got to take you there tomorrow. So we go there, and overnight, the Aspen had blown off. <laughs> it's kind of like the 20 years I lived in D.C. and the cherry blossoms never blossomed during the cherry blossom festival. <laughs> Dwayne, Let's talk about the word Durango. I think if you say Dodge City, it evokes very, very strong feelings, largely because of gun smoke, mm-hmm. first on radio and then on television. What is the magic of Durango? I had no idea what it was going to be like when I got here, but I had this incredible preconceived notion that it was an important part of the Old West. Durango is a Basque word, and it means meeting place, watering place, stopping place, a lot of people try to figure out what it means, Apparently, but they're all fairly similar. And there's a Durango, Canada, Durango, Mexico, obviously, and Durango here, Durango, Illinois. Uh, so it's not a, uh, an, an unusual word. It was named by the railroad, by the Denver and Rio Grande. We are a railroad town. And in the Old West, if you had a railroad, you had a future. If the railroad bypassed you, which it did towns, it absolutely killed them. In fact, you had to sometimes bow and scrape and meet their terms. Uh, but Durango was fortunate. We were here. There was a little town called Anima City, which is the north part of Durango. And we were the farming and ranching area for the mining uh, district up in the San Juans up north. And so when the railroad came, Anima City, and I always told my students this, Anima City misjudged history. The Denver and Rio Grande would come up to a town, and they would say, We'll build to your town if you will give us something. Mm-hmm. It could be a depot, it could be land, it might be $50,000 for a big town. But some consideration, yeah, some, right. some perk to get the railroad to come there, prove you want it. Exactly. And Anima City, and this is a story I told my students, Anima City misjudged history. And if you don't pay attention to history, Cleo, the muse of history, will kick, will kick you. Anima City said, you've got to come here. Then the Rio Grande said, no, if you don't meet our terms... But we're going to build our own town. And so in 1880, they got at loggerheads. Anima City wouldn't give in. Drangle was started by the Denver and Rio Grande. The Denver and Rio Grande in 1881 built up the Silverton, went right past Anima City, never stopped there. Uh, you couldn't get, you had to come down here to get the train. And Anima City hung on as long as it could. Drangle was within six months, 2,000 people. Anima City had 200, so that's what happened. Does it exist today? No, it, it does. It's the, it's the north part of Durango. So essentially it's a neighborhood, in, yeah, in it, a, larger than a neighborhood, well, but it certainly is not. Oh, no, it's not a separate community. And, and it, it was just funny because if you look at our town, only one street goes through, all the way through. That's Maine. Otherwise, they came to the boundary and they stopped. Wow. So Anima City... Made a horrible mistake and paid for it. You know, there, there are some great parallels in the early days of the automobile because the Lincoln Highway, for those who need to be educated about this, would become the first transcontinental U.S. highway. It was the brainchild of several people, and it actually connected a lot of pre-existing ruts across the U.S. But when they announced where it was going to go through the, the states, towns got in an uproar. They said, well, if you only move it 10 miles north, 
you know, it's going to be much better. Well, much better for their merchants, right? But no, I I, I understand that. It, I, I I think it took me a while to realize the preeminent importance of the railroad in this country, particularly west of the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. The other thing the railroad did, obviously, uh, you're digging the gold and the, some of the silver up at Silverton in the San Juans, and the smelter was built here, where you work the ore and get the gold and silver out, make it really simple. It was a technical process. but So Durango had the, had the, the business district, it had the railroad, it had the smelter, the farmers and ranchers in the valley down here. So it had everything. And poor little Anima City struggled along. And it was a, it's a lesson that people need to learn. I mean, it's still going on today. It's not something rare. Well, you hear a lot about a company such as Walmart that wants to build one of these massive distribution centers. I mean, the, I don't know how many football fields large the building is. And then you see all the semi-trailers lined up, about 150 abreast. Many small towns fought that. Uh, I won't mention names, but I know specifically of a city in California where they said, it's going to cause pollution. There's going to be too many trucks coming through here. And about 20 miles away, another city called up Walmart and said, we will give you the land. We need the jobs down here. So it's funny. uh, Priorities can really be messed up sometimes. Now, Now, the railroad came here in what year? 1881. Did it come in from the south or down from the north? It came from Denver, swung around New Mexico, and came up from the, from the south to get here. But it was a roundabout way. It took a full day on the railroad. I was going to say that that's a cockeyed way to do it, but I guess they found a better way to get through part of the Rockies. Exactly. They, and they went managed around. to go around the south end. And, you know, if you ask people where the first transcontinental railroad was, many of them don't realize that it went up through Wyoming yep. and Utah. And I remember in a discussion, somebody would say, well, the Rockies were a lot less steep in the south. Why didn't the Transcontinental Railroad go across the South? And the reason was the South didn't like us yep. when, we, when they started the uh, building the Transcontinental Railroad. So north of here, I should explain, by about how many miles is Silverton? Fifty. Five zero. Yeah. Fifty miles. And it's treacherous, treacherous driving. I came across three passes in the snow today. Yep. So the railroad went north from here. Now, I assume that the narrow-gauge railroad, which is now a tourist attraction, mm-hmm. the excursion train that runs from here up to Silverton, is the remnant of that. It is. You see, the reason it's narrow-gauge, which is three feet between the rails, is that the fact that they can go around sharper curves, up steeper grades, and it costs less to build. Mm-hmm. You couldn't have built that standard gauge. No, I am so incredibly in awe of railroad engineers. I saw an incredible documentary about the Transcontinental Railroad, mm-hmm. how they got it over Donner Pass. And I think a lot of people never stop to think that we're in a car, you can go up and down hills. A railroad has to move in a perfectly straight line, cannot go up too fast of a hill. And to keep that straight and get over a mountain is a miracle. I don't know how they did it. They had to build a lot of tunnels, yeah, of and, course. And, well, that's, not, of course, there aren't any tunnels on this up, up to Silverton, but there's some very gradual curves. Tell us about, before we turn around and go backward in history. Tell us about the current use of that track as, as, a, as an excursion train. I'm sorry, I don't have time to take it. That's, that's, that's too bad because it's one of, our, one of our economic pillars without any question at all because now they run in the summertime, fall, and spring, and they also have a winter excursion, which only goes part way up mm-hmm. because in the top of the, or the north end of the canyon, it gets too much snow. But without that, our... Our tourist economy would not be what it is. I mean, you, you have to look at that, frankly. We've got beautiful scenery, good climate, but we've got something that other towns don't have. A railroad that runs into the mountains through a canyon, scenery and history that goes with it. So, Well, you know, if that railroad were only a, quote, Disney-type attraction, it would be phenomenal. But when you realize the history it's teaching and preserving, that's an incredible second layer. Oh, it's it very important to this. And you, you need to thank the owner, Al, Al Harper. Al Harper has been magnificent with that railroad. He's bought, he's, we have a whole railroad yard down here where they build cars, repair engines, and all kinds of things. So, in fact, they bring in those, those narrow-gauge engines from all over the country here. Really? Yep, because yep. Al has that type of 
facility down in the railroad yard. Now, isn't there an excursion train up closer to Denver? I'm trying to remember the cities it runs between. You, oh, see, it, one you see it on I-70 for a little bit. Yeah, time. yeah, it, that, that runs up uh, Canyon City Way up there, up, yes. up, up that canyon. But it, I don't want to run it down. I'm not going to, but it has nothing compared to what we have. No, I'll tell you, if I was thinking as I was driving across those mountain passes a little squeamishly, and I could see the tracks at, at a time. What a phenomenally beautiful ride that would be in any season. Mm-hmm. Fall when the aspens are in bloom, winter through the, uh, through the snow. I took Amtrak last year from California to Houston. There were some major problems that were not, that were not Amtrak's fault. But when everything was moving smoothly, I'm sitting there eating breakfast on China with a big glass of orange juice, watching the scenery go past. And I thought, why haven't I done this before? And when I was in Glenwood Springs yesterday, there were 15 people who come in on Amtrak from Chicago, Mm -hmm. a group of seniors uh, from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, by the way, and they were just, they had a wonderful time on the train. How long is the trip up up to Silverton? It's a morning or an afternoon. It's three hours. Round trip? Three hours one way. Three. That's what I was thinking. It would have to be three hours one way. It it leaves how early in the morning? Uh, in the in in the summertime they uh, they run a little different schedule. I think the winter excursion, which we're on now, I think it's eight thirty. Mm-hmm. So and not, and you get back about what supper time that afternoon? About four thirty five. Four thirty five. Yeah. They that's what keeps Silverton going. Otherwise, Silverton would be in trouble if it wasn't for the railroad bringing in people year round, because Silverton. The mines are pretty well dead, mm-hmm. and they're isolated up there. So, Well, I don't want to give Silverton a shot in the arm because I'm here in Durango, but I expected Durango to be about the size of Silverton. I don't know why. Silverton, you're absolutely right. If you were to take away the myriad restaurants there and bars, I don't think there'd be anything left because it's all a service town. That's, That's- yeah. Pretty much what it is. The only thing you left out were the tourist shops. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah you, you can a buy postcards. A lot of postcard shops up there. So when when was the railroad extended then from here to Silverton? Well, it was originally going to Silverton because we basically uh, were built by the railroad, but they were going to Silverton, and it reached up there, and they, they built from here eighty one, and they reached there in eighty two. And That's pretty fast work, considering what they had to do up on, in the mountainous area. Yeah, well, they had they worked. Uh, they'd actually stop start or they'd uh, run the run the surveys, and they started down here in the valley, mm-hmm. uh, getting getting the road ready. So, they, but they uh, they worked fast because that's where they make money, and mining was big. <laughs> well, you mentioned that this area became the agricultural uh, area for the mining industry. It's Geographically, when you come over that last mountain range and come down toward Durango, it, there's an incredible difference in the lay of the land oh, yeah. in a very short period of time. It, it becomes this wonderful, broad area that just has farming and ranching written all over it. Well, Silverton, as we jokingly say, has a, a 30-day frost-free <laughs> summer season. Down here we go 80 Sometimes 100 this year. Well, it came pretty close to freezing last night. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's a much longer growing season. Now, we can't grow everything, but we can grow a lot. Now, what are the industries here then? Agriculture still? Any ranching? Uh, ranching, farming, the college, tourism, oil and gas. So in, you're pretty diversified compared to a lot of cities in which I've done shows that if one industry would fall apart, such as the silver mining mm-hmm. in Silverton, you don't have much to fall back on. I tell you, one of the key ones is the is the college. It really is because it brings people in. It's uh, well, thirty five hundred, four thousand students, depending what year it is and all. And uh, it's just a four year school, a liberal arts school. But that's that's key because it brings in people, that brings in visitors, brings in parents, and so. But you know, that's a good size for a four year school. Yeah. Um, I've, you went to college where, sir? CU, University of Colorado. Okay, I went to Indiana University. But before that, I had gone to a junior college, which at the time was the only junior college in Indiana. All the other small schools, Hanover, schools such as that, were little four-year schools. Mm-hmm. But I treasure the fact 
that before going to that massive, they turn you into a number campus in Bloomington, Indiana, I went to a little comfortable junior college where everybody knew everyone with a dynamic president, and they had a rule that you had to attend a certain number of days in class. Not quite 100%, but I'll tell you, I would not have succeeded in college had there been that little bit of discipline. And I think small schools are nice that way. What, what's the name of it here? Fort Lewis College. Fort Lewis College. Now, see, originally there was a military post southwest of town, and uh, the military post built in 1880, 1890, was turned into a Native American boarding school. And uh, by the 1940s, after the Second World War, it was dying on the vine out, out there, so they brought it into town, put the campus up where it is on, on top of the little mesa there on the east, east end of town, and it really took off. Uh, Native Americans can come to Fort Lewis free. That was part of the agreement mm-hmm. when they, uh, they turned the land over to Colorado, I mean the original post out there, of which we actually sort of have – we're uh, – sort of in charge of it, but there's not a lot left from the old military post, a lot from the boarding school. But mm-hmm. anyway, so um, they are the largest ethnic group at, at, at Fort Lewis. And uh, it's, we've really had a good, good track record with them. And I think the quality that a school like that has brings a lot to the community. I remember interviewing someone one time who said, if you look very simply at the quality of people we have in Kiwanis and, and Rotary and Knights of Columbus and American Legion, we have a, a lot of people who have come in connected to the school who contribute incredibly to the city itself. That's absolutely true. So it's a huge infrastructure in a, in a really good trickle-down sort of way. Oh, an excellent trickle-down, and uh, Durango would be what it is, I don't want to sound biased, if, if the college wasn't here. Uh, we'd just be another tourist town. Mm-hmm. But this has a depth which most most communities don't have. We have concert series, all kinds of things like this. Uh, and the people, being college college professors or working up there, they are used to talking in public. So you'll see them all over the place. So you'll see them in, in a city council. You'll see them on boards. I mean, it makes a huge difference. Well, in the reverse of that, near where I had worked in California at one time was a closed Air Force base, Castle Air Force Base which was the B-52 training site during the Cold War. Every pilot, every crew of a B-52 went through there once. And, of course, a huge number of employees who were there all the time. And in an interview I did, the fellow told me the same thing. He said when those people left, all of a sudden it was was a brain drain. The the wives, the, the guys themselves who worked on the base, who were working with PTA in the schools and volunteering and doing all of these other things were gone all of a sudden. So thank goodness it's working the other direction for you. Well, I can tell you one thing that happened. When they moved Fort Lewis College into town, almost all these streets were, except for Maine, were dirt or gravel. And the college people got involved and got the city council, and they, and they finally got Got the streets paved, which is a tremendous upgrade right right there. You can fight City Hall. Oh, yes. In that case, if you have a little bit of clout. Let's talk a little bit about the building we're in. We're in the Strater Hotel, S-T-R-A-T-E-R, which before we went on the air, you were telling me was the direct result of the railroad coming in. Right. Uh, Henry, Henry Strater built this in the early 1880s, and, uh, well, a little bit later, mid-1880s. But anyway... Every railroad town wanted to have a first-class hotel. If you look at the histories of even some of the ones that are out in the middle of nowhere, they'll probably have a real nice hotel because you want to get the travelers to stop. And trains at that day and time quite often didn't run a uh, full-day uh, trip. Anyway, so the Strader was built. We had some other ones here, but the Strader, it did two things. It, it's only a couple blocks from the depot, which is south of us, and it solidified Main Avenue as the street in town. So the Strader, uh, Henry Strader himself, lost the hotel, but the name is, hang- is hung on, and it's uh, a tremendous replica of that era, Victorian era. Well, it's on a, a very impressive corner here. Oh, yeah. It's pretty much in the middle of downtown. Yep, and see, yeah. it's only, as I mentioned, only a couple blocks from the depot, which was important. Oh, they, they ran a 
Tally ho, I don't know if your listeners know what a tally ho was, but it was like a stagecoach, but a little, not quite, <laughs> but it carried people around. And so they, w- they would pick them up here, and then they would bring them right up to the straighter. Mm. And so uh, they, uh, it's kind of a funny story. As was quite typical in a lot of towns, the red light district, saloons, bars, brothels, was all down at the end of Main Street, right around the depot. And so they, the, they got the quote-unquote good people off the train, got them on a tally hill, and got them up here so they didn't corrupt themselves by walking past saloons, gambling hells, and everything else. Yeah, look straight ahead as you head for your coach. Don't, don't notice what kind of neighborhood this is. It's too bad that traditionally in many big cities, the area around the bus station and some of the decrepit train stations yeah. were, were really places you'd rather not go through at night. Oh, yeah. Unless you had a reason, unless you... You know, you you wanted to go down there to to do a little business. What's the reaction that you have seen from? I'm thinking a child walking in here who's only seen a Howard Johnson, you know, or a Ramada. That this is so evocative of every Western movie they've ever seen. Well, my daughter certainly thought so. She thought this is something out of the old West, which I imagine is the reaction, as you said, of a lot of little kids or. Up, up to teenagers, and teenagers ages probably aren't impressed, but uh, I think it's it adds atmosphere to this town. And uh, we've tried to keep Main Street sort of, un, you, you'll notice there aren't any signs hanging out on lights flashing. That was intentional. They, they, they wanted to keep this sort of an original like it once was. Well, if I were in charge here, I don't think I would want a McDonald's downtown because you have, you have to strike an interesting balance between preserving the history yet having modern day businesses. By the way, if you want to look at our McDonald's, look at it carefully because we wouldn't the city council would not let them in there using the typical building that they use. Really? Yep. Is it near here? Right in back was here. That's, <laughs> I didn't even notice it when I went by there. You know the the uh in Sedona, Arizona, which is famous for its red rocks, mm-hmm. the McDonald's there has kind of pinkish coral arches well, in order to fit in. It, it has, uh, I'm not going to say kowtow, it, it decided to conform. Go, <laughs> go, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you, but go look at ours and see if you can find an arch. Okay, <laughs> I'll do that after I leave here. So th- th- this was the, the pretty much the center of town. Did it fall into disrepair at any time? Did it go through a bad yeah, era? it did. Uh, the, the town did. Uh, in the in the 19, what kept the town going was the smelter over here, bringing the ore down from Silverton and elsewhere. Plus, we have coal mining. And in the 1920s, the mining collapsed up there. Uh, it collapsed quite a few places in Colorado. And so the uh, smelter closed in the, in the early 1930s, and that was the big business. And I've talked, well, I came in 64, and so I started interviewing people in the 1960s. And they said the town really slip down when that smelter closed. So it's a double whammy. It happens during the Depression. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, it, not until after World War II did it come back up. Now, how long did the railroad operate as a commercial, regularly All scheduled venture? All the way down here 1949. Oh, so through World War II. Yeah. I guess it was pretty important for the war effort also. Uranium. Do, do, uranium. uranium was mined here, yeah. In fact, the uranium that was used, a lot of the uranium ore that was used, pitch blend, kernel type, uh, for the uh, first two tests came out of here. Wow. I'm, I'm just finding Durango to be a hundred times more than I expected. Well, thank you. Now, I'm, th- I'm not saying that because I work for the Chamber of Commerce or anything, but I really expected Durango to look like Dodd City, you know, just to be small. What's the population here? 15,000. So approaching twenty thousand, maybe well, one of these days. Tack on that, the number of students of the college. Okay, you've got twenty. You got twenty thousand here. Then, what are your seasons here for tourists? Is it a year-round destination? I think so. See, we have skiing in the winter and the train. We have uh, all types of nice climate. Uh, we have hot spring pools. Uh, we've got a lot of things. I'm just trying to to figure what this hotel would have looked like in the late 1800s. Do, Much did, like do, this, do, but, but texture-wise. But I'm trying to to think. Do you do you have any famous people who were shot in the lobby, or are there no, no. stories? Because almost 
most other towns, they will, you know, Deadwood Larry was yeah. killed. There's the bullet hole. Yeah. It's still no, right over no. there in the wall. I tell you what, in the 1940s and 50s, a lot of Western movies were made here. We were quite a Western outlook for uh, for uh, Hollywood because of the atmosphere, the climate, the uh, scenery. We have mountains. We have deserts. We have valleys. We have old buildings. Louis L'Amour was here. Louis was the Western writer, writer who wrote yeah. so many mm-hmm. Western novels. Fascinating individual, by the way. Tell me about him. I got to know him. Louis uh, was outgoing. He would come in to a restaurant and uh, be having supper, and his fans would see him. They'd come in. He'd stop. He'd sign their books. He'd shake their hand and talk to them. He, he could never be un- unknown because, I mean, he, he was just so outgoing, and he knew his history. He read. I was amazed. I, as I said, I got to know him very well because... In what era did he live? Oh, Louis? Yes. He was here in the 50s and 60s. Okay. Uh, it might have been in the early 1970s. Because he probably is among the top two or three internationally recognized American Western novelists. Yep. And if, if you'd have met him, you wouldn't have known... I mean, you'd know who he was, but mm-hmm. he didn't put on airs. He was just the most... Interesting, down-to-earth individual you could ever hope to uh, meet, and I, I got him to autograph all his books. Wow. I got a complete collection of Louis L'Amour's. My goodness, you know, you could go on that uh, road show, that antique road show. I remember one of the episodes, uh, and they find out in advance, of course, and research it, but a fellow had a set of books that his grandfather had given to him, which was every book Darwin ever wrote. Oh. And they were all autographed. And they were all first editions. Oh, my gosh. And the antique guy looks at him and said, you know, these are worth about a third of a million dollars. And I thought the guy who owned the books was going to faint. Dollar signs were lighting up because I'm thinking to look at the guy, I'm thinking he's not going to keep these. He's going to sell these right well, now. Well, you've got a problem automatically. I mean, if that gets out and it's in your house. Uh, yeah, well, it's not wraps. Well, I've... I have my my uh, my books are all paperback. Uh, and you've written how many? Me personally? Yes. Fifty-five. Are they all generally about the same topic? No, no. I uh, I write about Civil War history. I write about the West. I write about mining. I write I write biographies, Colorado history. Did you see the movie Gettysburg? Yeah. That turn- what did you think of that? I liked it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was better than I thought it was going. Yeah, to be. it's too bad only about thirty-eight people saw it. I think they didn't see it because it's nearly four hours long. Yeah. But it, it, I've been watching pieces of it. I've really gotten into the Civil War the last six months or so. I interviewed remotely the chief park ranger at Antietam mm. the other day, which was the bloodiest single, single day, day for yeah. the American military in, in our history. But the, the Turner movie was interesting because Turner realized that there were twenty or 30,000 people in this country who yeah. owned their own Civil War uniforms. Yep. And reenact battles. So he said, if you want to come to Gettysburg, I'll feed you. Just just bring your, your uniform. I thought it was a splendid movie. I, I actually have a uniform. You I, do? I didn't go to uh, Well, you're not old enough, for one but, thing. Uh, I, the uh, uniform is a replica of my great-great-grandfather's 8th Illinois Cavalry. Wow. In fact, I, right now, I'm working on his letters and diary. It's a Civil War manuscript of his career. Well, that, that's the one thing that... Uh, documentarian Ken Burns realized early on is the wealth of information in diaries and correspondence. Because I I would think a major portion of what we know about colonial times, for example, comes from people's diaries. It does, because the newspapers weren't that good. Yeah. They were out here, you know, they did one on one of their uh, series of national parks was was Mesa Verde. Mm -hmm. So I I didn't get to meet Ken, but I met all the all the rest of them. I wish that there had been the quality of documentaries when I was in high school mm-hmm. that there is now. Oh, it's we tremendous. had some stuff, but most of my knowledge of history was out of books. Now, I did start freshman year of high school in 1961. So I was in high school during the centennial of the Civil War, oh, and we got all brand new history books. Oh. So just about every day we were talking about what had happened 100 years ago. The, the thing that I think, other than the, the fact you cannot comprehend the bloodshed and brother fighting brother yeah. in this, 
was the system of regiments from the states. Because that's a, that we don't have that now no. in, in the military at all. But there would be, what, a central rallying point, maybe Denver or a smaller city, and mm. there would be a regiment from there then that would join the Union Army? Or, well, see, at that time, no. My, my great-great-grandfather's regiment, his uh, company was Company K, and Company K all came from the little farming communities in his hometown. And so they, they, they knew almost everybody. And, of course, if one of them, you know, if they have a disaster and a lot of them get killed, it really is a terrible blow to that area. But uh, that's how they all enlisted. They went in with their cousins, uncles, aunts, friends, neighbors, maybe even their people they didn't like, but they were all in there. And a lot of them uh, lied about how old they were. Yeah. That's why you had the few remaining Civil War veterans had actually been 15 or yeah. a 14-year-old drummer. We're down. We have no world, of course, we have no Civil War left. The last World War I veteran lived in Charlestown, West Virginia, I remember, is gone now. Yeah. And how many World War II veterans are we losing a day? Thousands. Yeah, it's a phenomenal number. Yeah. That's what happens when we get older. That's true. All you the know, rest of those folks. The, per- the perspective changes in that. What is it like telling the story? T- tell us your adventures in not only through your books, but the personal appearances you've made and the reactions you get. Well, I don't want to brag, but it really No, quite... go ahead. We've got 20 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> They're really favorable. I thoroughly enjoy history. I try to make it come alive. I use a lot of, well, I, in, in my classes, I taught Civil War history up there. I use diaries. I mean, kids can look in other uh, books if they want to just get facts. Mm-hmm. But I want them to get a feel, a feeling for the era. What, what did people think? What was it like to live there? I, my code was I wanted to make history come alive, which I mentioned way back in the start of this. But I really worked hard on it because history is not dull. Teachers and writers are dull. Well, the great historian David McCulloch, who's won, I don't know, how many dozen awards for everything. Yeah. He wrote John Adams, that, and I think Truman yep. know, also wrote, and uh, first started working with Ken Burns uh, on the, the, the documentary about the Brooklyn Bridge. Yep. But McCulloch said, if I were a teacher, I wouldn't teach 1066. No. I wouldn't teach dates. Maybe 1492. I would teach situations and the evolution of what's going on. Because forcing children to memorize dates is deadly, absolutely deadly. What I did, I told him, I want you, I told my students, I want you to know the Civil War was 1860s, and the Revolutionary War was the 1770s, and then we'll work on it. I mean, I don't want you to think the Civil War came before the Revolutionary War and all kinds of things like this. So that was that was how I had to use dates, just as a framework, and understand that these. These things happen within a period of time, and they all have actions and reactions, and they have importance to us. And But I really worked with what was it like to live then. I think that's the way, because most people aren't generals. They're corporals and privates, maybe a sergeant. And so what was life? And I, I love to talk about <laughs> medical practices. That got them sick. Some students, actually, I, I, I would always forewarn them. I said, I'm, I'm going to talk about medical practices. And I said, if you uh, are a little squeamish or you just don't want to uh, yeah, If be the there, word amputation bothers you. Don't come. Or you don't have a shoulder anymore, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I talked about how they, you know, they didn't have any way to painkill except a shot of whiskey. When, mm-hmm. Especially about halfway through the battle, they ran out of everything. There are in museums, of course, bullets mm-hmm. that patients have been told to bite down on yeah. and mm-hmm. strain when they're doing something yeah, well, they horrible. Did know that they were lead bullets. And they will bite into those bullets. Yeah. Well, it must have been terrible. I, I think a lot of people died because of the shock of the operation as opposed to the yeah. wound. And by the way, in the uh, I was just looking at this today when I was working with great-great-grandfather because he got shot. Over 70% of the people who died in the Civil War did not die from war wounds. Disease? Disease, measles, mumps, mm. chicken pox, because most of them came from rural areas and they had built up no immunity. I the, never thought about that. The people yeah. who, amazing enough, survived the best were the people coming out of the slums of the cities because they had been through it all. They had built up some immunity. Here comes a healthy farmer, lad, been on a farm all his life, long come the measles, bingo, he's gone. We know there was one... I don't know whether it's a regiment, a division, what, what you would call it. Being an Irish-American, mm-hmm. Dennis Michael Daly's 
pretty darned Irish. That sounds a little Irish. And I, I don't mean to trounce the, the Southerners here, the, the, the southern part of the country, but the role the Irish soldiers played, you constantly, the brigade, you yeah, constantly hear Irish, about the Irish. Tell us about that. Well, the Irish, there was a lot of animosity but, toward the Irish because they were the uh, last hired and first fired. Because a lot of Americans didn't like the Irish. They would come in. They were Catholic in the first place. Most Americans, they went to church at all were Protestants or claimed they were Protestants. And uh, so they had that. Uh, they were clannish. They lived in the cities. You very seldom, if you lived in a farm town in Illinois, you saw an Irish. You might as well be somebody from Mars because you just <laughs> didn't see right. them very well, especially at a borough. And so the Irish stayed together. And there were the city gangs of Irish, you know, fighting the other in gangs. So the Irish didn't have a very good reputation to most Americans. They've never seen it. Like a lot of Americans, had, well, until a few years ago, had never seen a black. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Irish came in, and they were tremendous fighters. They really were. Uh, <laughs> I think some of them thought they were fighting the British. <laughs> and off they went. But they were, uh, but, you know, after the war, a whole bunch of them planned to go back to Ireland and free them. Some of the Irish troops, that's the only reason they joined the Union Army was to learn military tactics. Fortunately, they got to Canada and they got stopped, but <laughs> it could have been a real problem. I mean, they were, they were serious about this. You know, we've been talking so much about the railroad, and I mentioned the, the Transcontinental Railroad, which Lincoln decided to build during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Why was it so necessary, psychologically, to join the East and the West at a time that the split was between the North and the South. Well, to uh, go back to the Ken Burns series, one of the statements he made was they were trying to tie the East and the West together before the South fell apart. Oh. <laughs> but uh, it was important because, of course, you need California gold to fight the war, and you need Nevada silver. That really, the Comstock out in Virginia City, Nevada, was key. It came in right at the right time in 64. While the, while the South was going bankrupt, cause, and they're printing paper money like mad, uh, which is now worth a heck of a lot more than it was back then, uh, you, uh, the North was able to avoid rising costs. I mean, costs went up, but uh, they didn't have the same kind of rampant, rapid inflation like they had in the South. So it uh, played a major role. The gold from Colorado, the silver from Nevada, the gold from California. Uh, without it, the North could not have financed that war. Well, and the other thing, too, and I think I mentioned this Every time we talk about the Civil War on this show, it was a, a line in the Ken Burns documentary talking about how anybody from Mars would have come down and looked at the Civil War and said there was no way the South could win. They had Robert E. Lee, yeah. who was probably one of the greatest generals who ever lived, and they had the fact that we, the North, had invaded them. They were defending yep. their homeland, which is always the home court advantage, is always better. But the line was, during a time when two-thirds of the able-bodied men in Alabama had either been killed or wounded, they were still having the Harvard-Yale yacht races, you know, which tells you a tremendous amount about how many people in the North, uh, the war wasn't that close to them. No. And another thing you have to keep in mind, they were, the South was desperately concerned about the slaves might rise up and revolt. And so they had to keep men back when they didn't have, when they were short of manpower, they had to keep them back. Uh, of course, the slaves never did. I mean, but uh, they, had they ever done it, it could have been a massacre. Well, look what happened to some of the countries in Africa when this, when the uh, blacks uh, got Well, and what free. the fear was in South Africa when the government changed there and they did away with apartheid. Yeah. Many... There was a mass exodus of whites from there. What was the role or the importance of newspapers and the newly invented art of photography in the Civil War? Photography was amazing because for the first time you could actually see. You could see, see dead bodies spread around. You could see people without, men without legs and arms. You could look at the hospitals. You could see the horror of war. It wasn't very romantic to look at it in the black and white uh, photographs of the day. And it, Really, for us, it's just tremendous. Before we turn this into a show about the Civil War, let's come back to Durango okay. here. During the Civil War, what was here? Southern Utes. They, so it was American Indians at, at that time. Yeah. See, so, we, so did Colorado play any part? Oh, yeah. We were, 
we went. We sent three uh, regiments of troops, Colorado Volunteers. They uh, fought in the border warfare in Missouri. Unfortunately, it also ended up with the Sand Creek Massacre because the uh, Coloradans and other uh, Westerners thought the, the South was stirring up the uh, stirring up the uh, Utes, Cheyenne, not, well, not so much Utes, but the Cheyennes, Arapaho, mm -hmm. and the Sioux. So there was always that fear that the uh, it didn't help after the war either because it was it really built up animosity toward the Native now, Americans. Colorado was admitted as a state in 1876. Yeah, with right? a centennial state. And that's it took me a long time to tie that together. Mm -hmm. I've just been handed a note not to completely change the subject, but if I say Chicago Cubs to you, what does that bring to mind? It brings to mind that I've been, as everyone that knows me, that I'm an ardent Chicago Cubs fan. Uh, my dad was a Japanese prisoner of war throughout the Second World War. And when he came back, he asked me, because I didn't even remember my dad. Uh, he, was, he went overseas in the Philippine Islands in 38. I was one and a half years old. Uh, so when he came back, he asked me what I'd like to do. And I said, I want to go see a Cub game because I listen to Cub games on the radio. My dad took me to 15 straight Cub games over the course of four years, and they didn't win a one of them. Oh. So I, I learned what it was like to be a Cub fan. Well, yeah, absolutely. What, what a, what a, if, if ever there were a bunch of fans who were long-suffering, mm -hmm. it had to be the Cubs. Yep. And they were well-funded. Oh, yeah. Had a neat ball ball. Still oh, had a neat ball ball. ball ball. Is that the second oldest ball? Fen yeah. Fenway is Fenway first. is the Red Sox. I know what the third one is, do you? Third one? It's a modern ballpark, but we've blown off so many of them. And yeah, the Yankee Stadium, all those are gone. Dodger Stadium. Dodger Stadium, yeah. Yeah, old Chavez Ravine. I've been out there, uh, out, out, at, out at the Huntington Library, doing research mm -hmm. on mining. And uh, we went to, uh, I don't know, it was so easy just to drive down from Huntington. Yes, I've had ballpark. I've had Carl Erskine on this show, oh. and he was telling me, uh, for those who don't know, he's one of the few remaining boys of summer. Mm -hmm. That was the Dodgers across 1950, the Jackie Robinson era with Robinson, Clem Labine, Duke Snyder, yeah. Joe Farillo, Preacher Rowe, yeah. uh, Carl Erskine, Pee Wee Reese. Yeah. He said that. Uh, he was there when they dropped the first wrecking ball on Ebbets Field, and he said he had to leave. Mm -hmm. And he I said the irony that. was they dropped it on the opposing dugout, which they hated. <laughs> but he said they had a great big cement ball painted to look like a baseball. Uh, I remember that. Dropped it, and he, he, the only three of the players were there. He said he got up and left. Yeah. So, uh, so I hope they never tear down Wrigley. Oh, they're, they're putting a lot of money in it now. They're putting up new, a huge scoreboard. Uh, and I guess there are still people who live in the neighborhood who sit on their roof. Oh, yeah. And well, they, they idiot, well, not idiots, I shouldn't call them that. They make a lot of money. They sell, they got seats up there, the little bleachers. <laughs> I don't know, you couldn't see the left fielder. I know, because I've been in Wrigley Field and eyeballed that, and it just didn't make any sense to me, but they sell hot dogs. I mean, they got a real concession <laughs> over there. Now, whom do you root for here in Durango? Oh, the uh, college. Well, a, a major sport. You're you're in a box kind of here. You're very close to the southwest corner well, I, of Colorado. So you got New Mexico, Arizona. Any loyalties there? Oh, well, Broncos. I like to watch the Broncos on television. Uh, CU, where I went to school. Uh, beyond that, my loyalty tends to be back in Illinois to the Cubs. I mean, I just uh, I live and die with the Cubs. Go down to spring training. I actually. I hate to use the word con, but the Herald made me a sports re uh, local reporter. newspaper. Yeah, the Durango Herald, and I went down there as as a newspaper reporter, and that gave me a pass into the dugout, talk to the players. I was the Cub fan was dying and going to heaven. Oh my lord! You know, the the one baseball person I always wish I could have interviewed was Harry Carey. I got to interview Harry Carey. I got to eat lunch with Harry. And Tell Dutch me about him. it. Oh, Harry. Is a hoot. I was a hoot. <laughs> uh, Harry loved baseball. He loved the sport like no one else. He knew the sport. I don't care what you think about it. He did not drink as much as people as he tried to let on, you know. Is it? Well, and the, the other thing about Carey, and Carl Erskine mentioned this, is when the Dodgers would play St. Louis, if they did something good, Harry would cheer for them. Oh, sure. And the St. Louis fans were very broad-minded. 
well, Harry, a- about cheering for the opposition. Harry loved baseball, and he understood baseball beyond what most people don't. And, and he caught flack for that. I know it, but he he was a he wanted the fans to enjoy the game as much as he enjoyed the game. So uh, that was one of the highlights of my life, uh, wow. interviewing Harry and getting to meet Dutchie, and I got to talk to her after he died and told her how much he meant to me. But he loved the fans. He would stop He would, he would stop and sign autographs and talk to the fans when he's eating lunch. If they wow. came up to him, you know, just, just like we were talking about Louis, Louis Lamar. He Harry, was Harry Carey. I hate to use the word one of the most unique, because that's not grammatical. Yes, you're just... But he was an absolute one of a kind. Now, there are some fine broadcasters. Vin Scully, who's oh, been Vince with the good. Dodgers yep. forever. And uh, I can't think of his name. Barber, not, not Red Barber. Miller. John yeah, Miller in yeah. Baltimore. And some of those guys, I guess many of them have written a book, but they remember everything. Yeah. Uh, Erskine told me he remembered every pitch for the first five games he ever pitched with the Dodgers. Jeez. You remember the temperature. I mean, I guess your first time on the mound in the majors, it's, it imprints on oh, you. Oh, I would think so. Yeah. I would really think so. It's just, uh, I've been, I've run around the diamonds, you know, and because uh, they have, sometimes they have, you can run around the diamonds, so I'll, just to do it once, I did it. I've not done that, but I have ridden around the track at Indianapolis yeah. Oh, and that, with Jay Leno driving. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's, that that's another re- reporter's perk you get. That was scary. But me. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Yeah. I and mean, here I am, all those years in radio, it's a tradition in Indiana, not so much anymore, but every radio in the state was turned was tuned into the 500 in the 50s and 60s with the great Sid Collins, the track announcer. And, but I'd never been to a race. So when I'm with United Press International, I'm covering the events for the 500, and the reporters were able to be driven around the track by Leno. And here he is. He's talking to me, leaning over, facing me, turning left on the track. And I'm picturing the headline, Tonight Show host and visiting journalist die in pace car accident. You know, but... <laughs> oh. You know, don't, don't you love it, though, uh, being a person who has been around for a while and so have i i mean i don't think either one of us will see 60 again no no it's in the rearview mirror is is the fact that we can't talk fast enough to share our experiences we almost need to split ourselves in about six pieces my my students said i always talk too fast they couldn't take notes (laughs) they would have me slow down but it didn't work because once i got excited about a topic saying a civil war topic or baseball or colorado history I just got going because I was so excited, just like, I'm, just like I'm trying to show you. Isn't that good, though, that you're multifaceted? I think, I don't know how multifaceted. I mean, if you were only Mr. Civil War, oh, I see you would you have a very limited range and you'd bore your students to death. Oh, yeah. Long. But because you can go off on tangents. I can bring the Civil War into Colorado, Colorado into the Civil War. Uh, I can get baseball, because where did baseball get its jump start? Civil War, because they had, baseball came up out of the 1830s and 40s in and you see photos, you see Matthew Brady photos yeah, of, them of, of them playing baseball at a, at a Civil War camp what on it, both sides. Baseball was an urban sport, but what the Civil War did, it made it a rural sport, and all rural and urban. So that's what really made baseball. I heard a comment the other day, and boy, we're going in circles here, but it's my show. So, okay, the fact that before, I think it was, was it Shelby Foote, was he the historian? Yeah said before the Civil War, we would say the United States are. Uh-huh. And after the Civil War, we said the United yes, States is. is. Yep. Yeah. He was here and talked. Fascinating, man. I got to meet him, too. Wow. I'm not dropping names, but I just... Uh, He's in every documentary, or yeah. was. He's gone now, but was in every documentary anybody did on Even the Even the baseball War. one. Really? Yep. He, you know, I haven't seen that one yet. Oh, you ought to. You ought to. Dwayne, let's wrap up by, by giving you the floor and tell those listening why they should come, if not to Durango, to some place where history is being preserved, where young people can see it. Well, I think the key to history is just not to read about it or see it on television, but to go to the spot, go to Valley Forge, go to Gettysburg. Go. I actually ran across Pickett's Charge so I could get the feeling. I mean, that's a, I mean I'm a runner, but I can't imagine what it is you're running across there and those guns are blasting a cannon, rifles and everything. Wearing uh, a wool uniform. I didn't wear that. <laughs> In the summer. <laughs> I know it. But history brings things alive. 
if you drive through a town, if you know something about the area, it's much more meaningful. So I told my students, I said, you use history every day of your life, even though you don't realize it. Uh, and it's something you, you just live, and it, it enriches your life. Traveling will mean a lot more to you. You shouldn't have got me on this topic. Uh, it'll, it'll mean more <laughs> well, to you. Well, and... you need to come to Palm Springs, and we'll do another hour. All right. I like <laughs> Palm Springs. <laughs> Dwayne, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I, I had a ball. I hope your listeners learned a little something along the way. I hope you enjoyed this interview from my new American Montage series. Check out YouTube for more. I'm Dennis Daly.